So Please, I mean, maybe, maybe I'll start. Yeah, I'll start because yeah. you know the thing is, um, uh, personally, I must. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure. Maybe apologize or or say. Um, I don't know too much about you. Good. I'd and, be happy to uh, fill in the blanks. And um, it se- uh, and it seems that many people do. And through these conversations I've been doing with other players, your name comes up a lot. And I and then I thought, okay, then this is this is the time to approach and 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 find you and hear your story because everybody says that uh, again you're from the first generation players. You uh, you have a lot of experience. You helped with uh, players to set up their rig. I, I heard about Michael Brecker as well somewhere on Dino Line. Um, wow, man, that's uh, that's already something <laughs> to to talk about. And uh, I'm curious just to know bas- basically your story, where it starts from, how you got the EVI, how how you started playing the EVI, and how it kind of went from there. Sure, I, I think it's actually um, not outrageous to mention the first few years before I got an EVI. Um, I was working as a full-time staff musician at Walt Disney World from a young age. And I think that <clears throat> that actual, uh, I was first actually working with um, a third party contract group that was playing at Walt Disney World. And uh, <clears throat> they, uh, we, we played on the stage. It was a rock and roll band that played Chicago, Blood, Sweat and Tears, you know, that sort of stuff, mm-hmm. Tower of Power, that music of the day which was great. We were a small horn band and, um, but we played opposite. We were on this stage that came up out of the ground at Walt Mm -hmm. Disney world. (laughs) And so, you know, we would come up, we would play for about 30 minutes and then it would go down into the ground. And, uh, and and this was a day gig, you know, we would start at around, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning and play shows until five or six in the afternoon, maybe do like five shows. Great opposite us sitting on top of our stage so when the stage was down this was the performance spot was a guy named michael iceberg and he had a solo synthesizer act from 1975 to 1980 Mm -hmm. and so this is obviously pre-midi and he had a very wide array of all of the currently available synths you know our Moog, um, Oberheim, all of these things, and uh, and some oddities. Uh, there was a thing called the Chamberlain, which was basically the American equivalent of the Mellotron. Okay. Which you know used actual tape. You'd push a key down, and the tape would start to play. When you release it, it would rewind. So it was the first primitive sampler. Wow. <clears throat> High maintenance. Took a lot of work to keep these things working, but nonetheless, this was his rig. In addition to having all this gear, he was a genius musician Mm -hmm. um, who he could hear music in any style after one hearing, play it back to you and orchestrate it on his synthesizers. Mm -hmm. And he was a very, very talented uh, orchestrator. And of course, at that time, we were all into uh, Tomita. And of course, um, uh, the uh, Walter slash Wendy Carlos of the day with switched on Bach. Mm -hmm. And uh, so nonetheless, Michael, it was called Michael Iceberg and the Iceberg Machine. And he had all this stuff and he had a show. Turns out I was living near him. We, you know, we lived in the same building. We were in the same parking lot in this apartment complex. We became fast friends. I, because growing up, I was always into, um, music concrete. When I was in high school, I was introduced to uh, music composition and theory in an uh, unusual way. It was, we, I had a teacher, we had a tape recorder in the school and we were making tape loops. And then it was put on us to start making musical compositions using sounds from around us, music concrete, you know, and uh, man, I got into that so much. I got a job so that I could buy my own tape recorder that had sound on sound, you know? So at any rate, I I did this. That was my background. Michael Iceberg and I became very good friends. Um, I had some experience as a recording engineer from college. That was my student job. So uh, 
we started recording together and I helped him record his out al- his live album of his show. We formed our own company called Hi Ho Music. Really great. Mm-hmm. Well, um, he always was exploring new things. So he would go to the NAM show. So he went to the NAM show in probably 1977 and saw Niall Steiner there playing this instrument with a keyboard player. I'm assuming that it was um, Shirley Walker, who was a friend of his, who eventually brought him to LA to play in his first big recording sessions, which was uh, Apocalypse Now. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, and uh, but so he and Shirley were just there. She's playing piano and they're just improvising together. And my friend, Michael Iceberg did me the favor of a lifetime. He went up and he said, asking him questions about it. He says, well, I have a friend who's a trumpet player and he's really into electronics and synthesizers. I'll bet he would really like this. Can I get your phone number? He hooked us up. Niall, you know, took my call. We talked about it. He, at that point, had not made one of these instruments for anybody other than himself. Mm. And he was still just refining the breath sensor so that it could actually be responsive and play dynamically. In the beginning, it just triggered notes. Uh, So he told me that it would be three or four months before he would really be ready to make it and send me one. And uh, I said, that's great, but I mean, how does this thing work? I hadn't heard it, didn't, hadn't seen it. He didn't have a photograph of it. I mean, I, he was just explaining it to me excitedly, my friend Michael. So uh, Niall very patiently described the instrument and said, you know, you, the instrument uh, has three buttons that you play with your right hand, like the valves of a trumpet. And then your left hand holds this canister and the instrument's about the size of a bug sprayer. And you rotate this canister and it changes the octaves. And then there's a button that you push to uh, lower the note a fourth. So it's like the harmonic of a trumpet going from C down to G. Mm-hmm. And when you get to the, you know, if you descend chromatically, then you get to an open G and you descend down to D flat, then you either have to, you know, go into the next octave lower or, you know, at any rate, he explained that to me and he said, uh, the canister is about the size of a tennis ball. I mean, he said that very specifically. And, you know, I really was so dense. I literally probably called him three times. And about the third time, just to ask him to explain the fingering system one more time, because I, if I had to wait months, I wanted to formulate this in my head a bit. I was really curious. So about the third time he mentioned, and the canister is about the size of a tennis ball. I said, oh, you know, I play tennis. So I got a tennis ball and I put it in my trumpet case. And so whenever I was practicing the trumpet, if I take a break, I'd pick up the tennis ball and look at what I was working on and go like, now, how would I play this on this new instrument? And, you know, I started doing that. And then I decided, well, I'll just start working through the Arben book or whatever. You know, in two weeks, I could pick up that tennis ball and anything that I could play on the trumpet, I could now do on this imaginary instrument with the tennis ball manipulated. Yeah, you know, so what I did, you know, so that was great. Of course, you know, three, four months down the road when I got this instrument, literally I could play it fluently as soon as I, you know, got the breath control thing adjusted and felt comfortable with it. But all of the musicians that I worked with, they all, I mean, word spread quickly. Hey, Sam just got this new instrument. It's really cool. And it's really easy to play because I just learned it. Um, 10 years later, it finally hit me that um, what had happened was I learned the technique of this instrument that I'd never seen or heard before. uh, And I had no reference to, but I completely learned this new technique without ever hearing myself make a mistake. Hmm. You know, so that when I picked it up, I had no negative feedback. And you know what I noticed is because once the Akai thing happened, I was out, you know, demonstrating it. I was kind of like their clinician. So I did it, you know, in a lot of places and met a lot of people. And, you know, I, a lot of people would pick it up and they would really, you know, they, it 
just one because of their ego they play something and it doesn't sound good because they're not familiar with it they go yeah uh you know this seems too weird it's too too difficult and i realized that i had really accidentally had this very luxurious introduction because i wasn't playing something that was completely foreign you know i mean i really understood how it was supposed to work now the interesting thing with these early ones the canister had uh, a rotary switch so that it just moved to click stops. Oh. And probably a year, since I was playing it every day a lot, after a year, all of the detents on that thing wore smooth. So it was completely, you know, just like playing the trombone, you know, I mean, it's really smooth. And, uh, but I got so that I could do that. Eventually, hmm. a few years later, he modified my instrument and converted it to the touch sensitive set, uh, uh, touch sensitive circuitry so he put the rollers yeah, right that was back in, in the days of like steiner parker right yeah the original it was even before steiner parker the first one was just a steiner okay. and then he started making the steiner parker stuff and i you know i was playing that uh microcon yeah, right, uh, right, right, right. which was a great little synth about the size of a cigar box you know super good but at any rate so you know i start you know i, I got that instrument started playing it a lot and uh you know, after I got that touch sensitive one, Niall um, started, he, he, he told me that he was going to be making some uh, more uh, complicated synths. He, he's building a synth. He was making a small number of them and he agreed to make one for me. And that turned out to be the one, but, but this time he was in uh, LA. He was doing studio work. Joel Peskin probably was the biggest guy behind him, you know, trying to get him to do stuff. Uh, and of course there, you know, everybody who saw Niall now on all these sessions, especially the woodwind players and that, they're going like, I'm missing out on work if I don't play this thing, you know? So there were a lot of people lining up to try to get these things from, from him. Uh, I think he, in that first batch, made about three EVI controllers and eight woodwind controllers uh, with the same synth mm -hmm. um, and I could be wrong that number may be up closer to 20 I don't know I think it I don't think there's over 20 of these things um, but he made this synth module and this was probably you know like 82 to 84 and that's right when MIDI was starting to happen and so we we're having conversations about the MIDI thing and uh he said that, you know, he'd been talking to J.L. Cooper, mm -hmm. who had already made a MIDI interface for the Lyricon. Mm -hmm. And he let Niall take this hardware piece and said, here, just go ahead and modify this for your instrument. Wow, that's great. One catch. He didn't have any of the code, the software code for it. And it had the controller, uh, basically the system, had about 200,000 lines of code. Okay. And Niall, his project now was to go through and one at a time, put in a hexadecimal code number, fire it off and see what it does and log it. You know, and so he told me that, yeah, so... Uh, I'm doing this. And when he explained the thing, and of course I was asking him, Hey, you know, I was really wanting this. He, uh, you know, eventually said, yeah, you know, I'm doing this. I'm spending about an hour a day on this. And I project it's going to take me about three or four months if I stay on task to finish this, you know, I'm like, what? and he said, yeah, I said, it's like doing a jigsaw puzzle, the size of your house with all white pieces. And yeah, you know, and I'm just, and you know, and of course this is in the background. I've got other, you know, I've, I've got my life going on and I'm working and, you know, I had a family uh, by this time. Uh, uh, my, I had three children, uh, eventually had a fourth. At, my last child was born in 1989, right? But, uh, but um, as I was waiting for the MIDI interface to be done, when we got really close to the end, Niall said they had everything done except the uh, 
the system for converting breath control change into MIDI velocity. Mm -hmm. And MIDI velocity is a set single number, you know, that happens. Yeah, when you push the key down, it times how long it takes and then it signs a number. Great. Trying to do that with a fluid, you know, uh, controller like breath, you know, he had to, it was tricky. So, and he was explaining that to me and I said, well, you know, why don't you just send it without that and then add it later? And he said, well, I would, but Michael Brecker said that he wouldn't use it if it didn't have velocity. And I said, oh, I didn't know that he even had one of these things. He said, yeah. And as it turns out, I was going to New York the next week. And he said, wow, if you're going to New York, you should call Michael Brecker. And I went, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and I, you know, I'm going like, you know, I doubt that, you know, but he said, no, no, he probably really want to talk to you. And by this time, I'd already had, you know, this synth module for a couple of years, and I'd made a template of the front face of it with all the knobs and switches. And I had a notebook filled with patches that I designed for this thing. And so I called M Michael. Turns out he returned my call. Uh, he was going to be in the city when I was there, he, and he was anxious to get together. And I said, great. So, man, we got together and I brought him a notebook of all these things. You know, when we first got together, it's worth even talking about this because it was a, a magical experience. Um, uh, he directed me to his place. And when I was getting close, he was out on the street and he came running up and says, oh, you've got one too. You know, because we both had the same like anvil style attache case. And that was the synth. You know, he was very excited to see that somebody else had the same case. We went into his apartment and... Uh, he had uh, in his living room, he had all of his instruments lined up in a row from flute and piccolo, clarinet, all the way down to baritone sax. And, uh, and he said, oh yeah, he says, you know, I'm still taking studio calls. So I kind of have to practice everything every day, you know, but we went back into his music room and, uh, and it was so long ago. I mean, he didn't have a mixer. And so we spent a fair amount of time just figuring out how we could plug our instruments into his stereo amp so that we both could hear each other at the same time. You know, so once we got that established, immediately he just started playing a bass line. And I went, oh, I guess we're gonna be playing together. So, you know, um, and so we start playing and in fairly short order, um, he was playing stuff that I, I really, I couldn't, link into, I th you know, I was uh, not incredibly developed and I'm sure, and he was obviously extraordinarily evolved in his harmonic uh, concepts. And, you know, so I think, you know, at the time I didn't know what was going on, but obviously he was trying to assess, you know, what my, you know, harmonic knowledge was and capability. Uh, and at that point, I'm sure he could have easily have just dismissed me and said, yeah, just, you know, you can just walk that way, you know, but we started playing together and um, I started putting, you know, my, some of these patches that I had in my notebook up on his instrument and then he was playing them and, and it was really fun. So, you know, there's, we, I had some sounds that, you know, he hadn't really gotten out of his synth at that point. He played some things that um, he'd been doing, but at one point I remember specifically, I, uh, I had this sound that, um, really sounded like a banjo because there was an envelope generator on this thing too that you could blend in with the wind and you could play it in such a way that you could actually get something that sounded like a, a pluck and a twang that sounded very reminiscent of a, a banjo. And, you know, so he started playing this and he went, oh, that's really cool. He goes, what are those guys playing? And he just started, started thinking and he was trying to imagine what was like those finger picking five string guitar uh, banjo players would play, you know, and, he did, and and then all of a sudden he's just oh, no, no, da, 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 da. and he's sounding like a you know bluegrass banjo player on the iwi, and I'm going, wow, man, that is like just crazy. But uh, is there the chance, next step, is there a chance that this particular patch, that particular sound, is something that he used with Steps Ahead? Well, you know, I mean, that was at the time when he was actually working on, uh, I think that album Magnetic. And so he, yeah, you know, there's that, stuff that, on there. this tune called C Cajun? C Cajun? Cajun, yeah, exactly. That you know, so. Sound? No, I don't think, I think on that one, actually, there's, I think there's a violin player also on that track. 
but I don't know there, you know, his sound that he uses on that. It's been a while since I've listened to that. I think it, it had other stuff in it, but you know, nonetheless, that was about the time that we started, you know, uh, being associated and he had, you know, he was, he at that point already had an Oberheim expander. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing was he was using that as his MIDI interface because he was going into that with voltage out of his main instrument. And then the Oberheim expander had a MIDI out and that thing, that thing you could, if you were controlling it with control voltage, it converted it into MIDI. And then he had several other uh, MIDI devices. I mean, he and I did not have our Steiner MIDI interface at that point. And, but this, it, while this was somewhat crude, it worked. And so one, the day after I got back to Florida, I called all over the state to find an Oberheim expander and bought it the next day. I had to travel about two hours wow. to get it, but <clears throat> for that reason. And, uh, but he was playing all kinds of stuff. And he, you know, once again, he knew uh, Joe Zawinul pretty well. <clears throat> they had done stuff together and he played. Yeah. So he played uh, this thing for, you know, he was showing me all these different things, but then, you know, he was playing different sounds on the expander. And then he just played like this five octave run up and down. That was extremely um, angular and uh, for all intents and purposes, really atonal, but it was very, you know, I mean, it was very symmetrical and he did it and he played it up and down like twice really fast. And he looked at me, and then he did it again. And he says, do you know what I just played? And I went like, I said, man, it was amazing sounding. And if I had a recording of it, I could probably transcribe it and maybe use words to tell you what I think you played. But he says, he says, well, you know, these expanders, they have this uh, rotate mode and you can assign each voice to a different transposition. So he had it set up, so it was just playing one note at a time. This was also part of the moving chord thing later. But he played this thing and he said, I was just playing a chromatic scale. And so he played this chromatic scale into the expander, but the expander was changing voices and it had a different interval. So if he went up a half step, the expander would go up maybe a perfect fifth. And if he goes up another half step, now this one would be down a third or whatever. So no, but this thing kept repeating over and over. So if he just played something, but he said that that was something that, um, that Zawinul used a lot, like where he would have, you know, either maybe some very, um, let, let's say a real generic pentatonic pattern that he felt comfortable playing, but he wanted to get more of an out sound in a certain place. Sometimes he would just call up that rotate function and play something and he could play it with great rhythmic confidence in that, but the output would be somewhat aleatoric. Wow. I yeah, you know, know so that, that Brecker had any connection with Zamino in that sense. Yeah, and and Jocko, obviously, well, obviously we know that, you know, through the Joni Mitchell stuff and all that, if not others, you know, um and Pat Metheny. That's probably what the connection was. That Brecker's rotation mode got inspired by Zavino. I think so. That's the way he explained it to me, at least as far as that linear part of it, <clears throat> that the, uh, I'm not sure, you know, exactly. Um, I got the impression that he came up with the, the using that um, rotate mode, because he had it together. He showed some of these things to me and then explained how he could create predictable moving chord things by create, you know, if he knew he was going to be playing in the Dorian key on his instrument, that he could set it up so that all of the subsequent chords that would come out would fit into a Dorian tonality. Hmm. You know, so uh, yeah, he, he was incredibly smart. <laughs> you know, I mean, he really, though, because when, when he explained how he did this, I was going like, oh, wow, you know, so then that way, you know, and you could hear that, you know, some of those rotate chord functions really 
um, had some pretty complex harmonies in them. For sure. Yeah, you know, but but it wasn't random. Like, and I, I'm struggling so much. I cannot. It, well, yeah, you know, uh, maybe sometime I'll, I'll sit down and try to draw a diagram of how what he did um, to do that because it was predictable the way he did it. And, you know, and you'll notice when he would do that stuff, sometimes he would play something and sometimes he would do something where he'd be repeating a note. And he would repeat a note because he was waiting until it got to the point where he knew this was a good starting point to run through. Do you know what I mean? Because he knew if I started at this point of that pattern, then all the subsequent notes, and it was, you know, and it, it, it wasn't like a, a Rain Man thing. You know, it was something that when you start playing it, you'll get a feel for it. And so, but, you know, that was part of, uh, of that style. When you hear him sort of improvising with that moving chord thing, you can hear sometimes where he'll be repeating a note. And I mean, musically it's valid and it kind of sounds cool because he's, he's doing something rhythmically and in time, but it, I'm convinced that he was doing it because he knew that when he got to the point, okay, this is the place. Now, if I start playing linear, this is going to have voice leadings that are going to mesh, you know? Wow. I know. And, it's and, pretty and, crazy and stuff. that rotator thing, you did everything on the expander, right? It was all made on the device itself. Yeah, yeah. The way the expander is set up is that it had three zones. And so he would set one zone normally to have one voice in it that played either unison or a parallel interval to whatever he was playing in. And then the next zone would have three voices so that every time you change notes, it would go from voice two to voice three to voice four, two, three, four, two, three, four, two, three, four, as you play subsequent things. And you know this one could be minus two half steps, plus six half steps, plus five half steps. Some, you know, something no, very, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then um, and then the other, the remaining third uh, zone, he would have two voices. And so now you have two voices going back and forth here and three over here, so that now you get this hocketing effect so that you'll get, you know, hits at with different combinations. So you'd have, you know, six different voice uh, interval uh, combinations. and. Uh, and like I said, you know, he, he just sort of created a grid so that, you know, he said, you know, across the top, he had the, the different voice transpositions. And then down this way, he would write, you know, um, notes of a particular harmony that he wanted to play and then move across and figure out, you know, the resulting uh, uh, potential harmonies that would come from it. But... Uh, yeah, I mean, it was really pretty cool. But nonetheless, after that first time of getting together, plus he had he had a primitive sampler, one of the early uh, uh, Akai samplers. I think it was like maybe the 612 or something like that, but uh, used like the little two inch floppies or maybe it was a five inch floppy drive. I don't know, it was old, old yeah. stuff, Flexi, the Flexi drives, you know, the real yeah, big yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but nonetheless, you know, uh, he had, you know, the, the expander was the biggest thing. And I think he also had a Yamaha TX7, which I had one of those already waiting to play that, which was a DX7 without the keyboard. And uh, and all of this stuff was before rack mounts. You know, all the modules that were being made weren't made to be rack mountable because, you know, that, ha that explosion hadn't happened yet. But... Um, and that was the unfortunate thing because the expander, which was so far ahead of its time, it really never was convenient to make that into a rack mountable device because the motherboards for that were like 20 inches long because the thing is pretty wide. You know, it's like about the size of a DX7 without a keyboard. And uh, um, the expander itself doesn't have keys, right? It's all no. So now the the the, the bigger it? version of that, which was. Uh, called the Matrix 12, which Brecker ended up getting one of those and he used that on the road. But all he did was basically double up his programming mm -hmm. and take advantage of the deeper, you know, doubling of those voices. And so that means this, the expander 
you said it had a MIDI in or you only had to control had or could control it. Oh yeah, no, it had MIDI in, out and through on it, but it also had all of the control voltage stuff. Right, okay. Right. Yeah, so you could really, and, and so in the beginning we were using it and, and I was using it eventually when we got the MIDI interface, we were using a combination of MIDI and control voltage. We were using MIDI to control the notes and then uh, we were using the control voltage for breath because at that point, the MIDI was still, it sounded so much better to use control voltage on the filters in that thing, you know. Personally speaking, I think up until today, control voltage is still sounding much better than MIDI. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, well, okay, here's another. I mean, I recently sent my Steiner, Steiner phone from that era off to Mark Steiner, who's doing a complete rejuvenation. So I'm waiting for that to come back. And uh, I've got the MIDI interface for it, but I'm, I'm thinking that I'm gonna go right back to square one of just playing that thing for the internal analog sounds and voices, which, you know, I, and you know, the, it, it was such a cool thing when the, uh, uh, when the Akai uh, opportunity happened, you know, uh, not once again, Niall, I guess we can shift gears into that right now. <laughs> well, one thing I was going to say is that uh, when I left from that point forward, um, anytime Michael got a new piece of gear, I would get it. And if I got something new, he would get it. And we, so we built our systems kind of homogeneously and so any programming that I could do, I would send it to him. And he sent me stuff too, you know, which was great because, man, he was an innovative programmer, in my opinion. I mean, just phenomenal. But he was so busy playing that just by the numbers, he didn't spend as much time programming. But, uh, uh, and that, you know, that was the beginning of our friendship, which was great, you know. And so we, we stayed in pretty close contact from that point forward. When the Akai thing happened, um, Niall called me up to uh, go to, to the Summer NAM show, which was in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, listen, you know, we've got this thing going with this Japanese company and they're gonna be releasing this thing worldwide and they're gonna need somebody who can go out and play the EVI. And at this point, he was very busy in the studios. You know, he was doing several sessions a day all the time. And uh, yeah, so in it, and it really couldn't be cost effective for him to walk away from any of that to uh, go do these uh, appearances. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was convenient that I already it was an evolved player of this instrument. And he said, so come up here and I can introduce you to the Japanese people. And that way they'll know that I'm not the only person in the world who can play this thing that they're manufacturing. Uh, luckily, you know, obviously with the woodwinds, it's much more, uh, uh, I don't know, synonymous. It wasn't as challenging uh, to just pick it up and play. Uh, it, let's say it's much more intuitive. Hmm. But uh, so yeah, I went there, met, met the Japanese people, and that was really great. And just, man, a couple of months later, the first big thing happened, which was this long, uh, at least a 10-day trade show in France that's called Salon de Music. Mm -hmm. And the first five days were for uh, dealers only. And then the last five days, they opened it up to the public. Mm -hmm. And we went uh, at least four or five days in advance to put together a show. And so uh, it was myself and uh, Fred Selden, who was a studio musician from L.A., but uh, he was flex much more flexible. He was kind of like, uh, at that time, uh, sort of like uh, one of the, uh, he wasn't on that first call list. You know, he's a super great musician, but, uh, but he was already doing like uh, Star Trek, The Next Generation and that. You know, he was already, it was around that time, 87, 88, mm -hmm. um, but uh, so Fred and I were uh, involved in this. And when we got to, we didn't have the Akai instruments yet. They you know, still hadn't been released in this country. And so when we got there, they had 
an EWI and an EVI for us uh, that had been sent straight from Japan. And I think they sent two more because there were um, these twins who were from France who were gonna be doing it there. Uh, and man, I can't think of their names at all right now, but they, but they were there, but they brought us in to kind of be the headliner clinicians. And we put together this kind of spectacular show and we had, there was a keyboard player from Paris who was a studio musician there. Mm -hmm who specialized in uh, like slapstick comedy stuff. So um, he, he, he had a really cool uh, demonstration using, you know, all kinds of sound effects and stuff from all the samplers. He had a big bank of these Akai samplers. And, uh, but we put this thing together, but when we received those instruments, they didn't work. Hmm. I mean, and so we were trying to figure out, they were really, really glitchy. Every time you would change octaves uh, or, yeah, it was just changing the octaves, going from one octave to the next, very unpredictable and very unresponsive. And so we were in Paris on the phone with Niall in California, trying to come up with a solution. And it took a couple of days and we finally figured out, because I think they had just shipped him one also. He got his hands on one of those prototypes and he discovered that they had made the decision the engineering decision to coat the posts that those rollers were on both on the iwi and on the evi they had little posts that came down the roller and then a nut to hold it in place and they had so that you wouldn't have to lubricate it which would be sloppy and messy they coated the posts with Teflon, but Teflon is a non-conductive thing. So it wasn't working. So we had to sit there and get some, we, we had to take them apart and then take some steel wool to shine them up, to take all the, <laughs> after that, they work great, but. <laughs> so, I mean, they never so, made it because actually I own one couple of those those uh, 1000s and i actually um, i must say that i i i adore them yeah no they're great they're great instruments but they, well they fix that that was they something that them, yeah. You know, yeah that was just something that you know on the first ones they were sending it out because they thought oh this will be a great way to not have to ever lubricate this thing it'll be quiet and smooth and oh but you know they didn't run that by nile you know nile made uh, several trips to japan right. to to work on this. And uh, that was another interesting thing was that literally he was getting ready to go to the airport to return home the last time. And they said, oh, by the way, could you put 64 sound, could you program 64 sounds into the thing? Cause it had, you know, eight banks of eight. Right. And so all of those original sounds, Niall did just like so fast, like, you know, so the, uh, which was, you know, unfortunate. But for me, you know, I ended up you know, uh, I programmed two banks of sounds for that. And um, Akai, when they were selling those instruments for the first several years, they put in a flyer in every box that, you know, encouraged people to contact me to buy my sounds. So I was selling sounds to virtually everybody who bought the EVIs and EWIs in the beginning, which was, yeah, kind of a windfall. I mean, they were, um, I was working for them, you know, on kind of an on-call basis. I was a full-time staff musician at Disney, but at that time, um, the talent pool was so deep here and so much stuff was going on that um, it was really, really easy for me to just sub out and go do stuff whenever I wanted to, if I had something interesting to do. And I had plenty of really good subs available. So uh, it was really uh, uh, kind of a really, it was a fun, fun thing. The first thing stateside that I did for Akai was I flew on a Sunday afternoon, I flew up to Atlanta and went to a bar that was closed that day. And they had Michael Jackson's band there. And all of those guys uh, were really big Akai users. It was for the thriller tour and Ricky Lawson's Ricky Lawson's had something of a relationship with Akai also 
because he uh, used the MPC-60 drum machine and various other things. And several other people in the band did it. And the way that tour worked was every city they went to, the band had a week off because it took a week to set up the venue for the concert. And uh, so, you know, people, they would uh, have hotel suites that they would set up as a studio and do studio work. And I mean, it was a crazy thing, but they were basically somewhat bored. And so they started doing regular clinics in every town they could for Akai. And Akai would fly me up to do clinics with, you know, Ricky Lawson's and uh, oh, what's the name? Greg Fillingaines. It's just unbelievable player, you know, and uh, uh, that was, it was pretty, pretty fun and exciting and super intimidating in the beginning. But, uh, uh, but yeah, interesting times. Um, trying to think, you know, shortly after that, you know, the, and, you know, at that time, that's also about the time Michael Brecker, you know, released his first solo album. And, uh, and that's when I, I made a trip up to New York to help Michael kind of uh, smooth out the edges uh, because in the middle of his concerts, he would always do like a solo iwi thing. So he, you know, construct and you've probably seen some of those videos. Sure. And so we would, you know, we would have the task of trying to figure out how he could get from the very beginning of that to the end without having to take his hands off of his instrument. So he had, you know, a kind of elaborate pedal system in addition to just stepping through and, um, it was driven mostly by the Akai Iwi module, the EWV 2000. Mm -hmm. um, I think, boy, I'm trying to remember exactly how this works. I think, uh, I think what we just did in that was we, um, oh yeah, yeah, we were using that and a, combi a combination of that and uh, this uh, MIDI patch bay called the MX8 mm -hmm. by Digital Music. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was uh, a, a pretty versatile box. But what it allowed us to do is uh, you could send one program, you know, you could step forward with a patch on the Iwi, and then that would send a program change to the MIDI patch bay, which would then send individual program changes to all of the synths and signal processors. Mm -hmm. And the only, but, you know, I think the limit was, 50, uh, 50 memory slots on that, uh, on the, on the MX-8. So he had more than that in the number of changes that he had to have. And, but what we found out was that the Overheim expander had a chain mode in it where you could set up, you know, if you just, if you had a pedal directly plugged into that, you could then just change the sounds on the expander. And that worked fine for a lot of the things that he wanted to do. So in the middle of the thing, um, he could switch in and out of the sounds that he wanted the expander to be playing just by hitting only the expander pedal. I see. So, uh, and, and, you know, once again, we, we discovered all kinds of things. Um, it was having a, yeah, you know, it's so funny, but that was where, you know, we, we had some really good times working through that. We, it, we were there doing that about five days, I, as I recall. And I mean, and it was one of those things when we would start to work, time disappeared, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, like Michael's wife would walk in and go like, hey, do you guys, uh, you want to have some dinner? He goes, like, what do you mean? He goes, like, well, it's like five o'clock. What? You know, and we'd been going since like nine in the morning or something, you know. I think, you know, this, you know, brings us up to the point where uh, the MIDI EVI from Nile started happening, you know, and uh, um, I, yeah, you know, th that was really um, pretty amazing because the capabilities of it were so significant. Um, and I really got into using it. And, uh, you know, all the way up until the time uh, Johan uh, made the new EVI, you know, I was using it and I was always very interested in somebody else, you know, taking, oh, taking the torch and continuing on. And, and boy, the Berglund stuff is so great. And he's the best guy out there to do this. It's really, uh, 
uh, terribly exciting. And I see great things coming in the future uh, from that. But, um, uh, but that was a game changer for me. Um, I, you know, it happened at about the same time that um, I started this band. I had a band that was called Ethnotech that was kind of a jam band. And, you know, I really populated it with just musicians who were open-minded compositionally, but really came from a jazz background, mm. you know? And, and um, you know, that was actually, it was around 1999. And I really, really remember it was, I, I, some people at Disney were getting ready to have some uh, big uh, Y2K mm -hmm. events, you know, with the, the coming of the year 2000, they had some big press events and uh, they were really interested in having something that was, that sort of fit in the mold that would be really different and unique. And so, you know, uh, I had a friend, named Keith Wilson, who's a great drummer and uh, played the Zen drum. And so we started, you know, uh, have you heard of that? Are you familiar? No. Oh, wow. Oh, I'll, yeah, I'll send you some info on that. The Zen drum, it's worn like a guitar and it's got like 36 touch sensitive controllers on it. And so you, you can play percussion with it. Is that um, that's, um, that's like the syntax. Uh, it looks like the syntax. And as a matter of fact, um, is that that? Is that the thing? No. no. Um, okay. Somebody mo modified one of those things. Um, yeah, what's his name from? Uh, it's called. I think his name is Future Man. And he yeah, yeah, right. You know, and, that's yeah, Roy Wooten. Ben, no, yeah, Bella Fleck. And, and the Fleck Tones. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Now he switched over, and now he plays the Zendrum, which is made in Atlanta, and those guys are from near there. But uh, yeah, but. Um, uh, this friend of mine, Keith Wilson, I, I met the people from Zendrum while I was doing NAM shows and stuff and became friendly with them. And I actually would go over to their booth on my breaks and play with their people and stuff. And it was really great. They were super good people. And they gave me a Zendrum to bring back to Orlando. And right. so I gave it to my friend Keith. And honestly, he became one of the very best of anybody I ever heard play it. You know, and there's a lot of people out there, but he's a, you know, super talented musician. So we started brainstorming and came up in, you know, in the first hour that we were going to call this thing ethnotech because uh, it was going to be multi-ethnic and high tech, you know, pretty simple, but it was going to be, cool. but we decided that we wanted to make it pure because they wanted it to be unique and different. And so whenever we played all we would do was ask how long they wanted us to play. And usually those people are on pretty tight timelines for corporate gigs and stuff. Mm -hmm. And in short order, I mean, one, it sounded so different than anything else that they were using that all the people from the event planning companies loved us and put us on the top of their list as something different. And so every time somebody would come to town, uh, to buy an event, they would say, you know, we've got this slot here. We want a jazz trio for this, and we need a top 40 band for this, but we all, we're also going to need something different. All the event planners would all say, oh, well, you should get this group Ethnotech, you know, and oh. uh, it, you know, I'd always hear from these people. They go like, man, you know, when we put this thing together, we got a lot of different suggestions for different things, but every single person that we talked to always recommended you guys, you know, so, so we, we were doing something kind of different, and it was a the best gig because we would just go and just start to play and it was just completely improvised and we would just go wherever it led us and I'd usually have some sort of a stopwatch or something going like hey guys we've got two minutes so let's let's wrap this up figure out a way out you know uh and uh we did that for quite some time and uh Curiously, I was introduced to this keyboard player named Grayson Wells. And Grayson was a uh, studio musician. He, he was a studio brat. His father had a jingle house in Memphis. Okay. And it, it was really super busy. And Grayson just grew up in that studio environment and writing stuff for his dad. And, you know, he was a commercial composer. Uh, but we started doing some things. I met him and heard him and he's a really good synthesizer player. You know, he really, 
he played the sounds, you know, and, but he wasn't at all coming from a jazz background. And so I started booking him into this ethnotech thing. And man, it really, it just really worked because really? he didn't come anywhere close to overplaying, but anytime he played something, it was really thoughtful. Like, oh, this is a great, a great sound for this moment in time. And so it really went on. So we decided to evolve that relationship and form another band. And uh, we all started writing for this other thing. And Grayson, interestingly enough, um, he was a composer who didn't write anything down. He would sit at the keyboard and you know, his production process was he'd play into the computer and build his arrangements until it was completely done. So it was really like very thoroughly composed. And he would come to our rehearsals and he'd just give everybody a CD and say, look at next rehearsal, just, you know, learn this song. Hmm. And, you know, I've been at that point in time, I'd been a professional musician for a couple of decades and was very comfortable doing studio work and going in and sight reading and playing shows and all of that stuff. But it was always with music in front of me. And we put this band together. Um, and from the onset, everything that we did in these, you know, rather um, like th thoroughly composed arrangements, we did everything. We learned it all by rote. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up, uh, there was some interest at Disney in, in what we were doing. So we did this showcase and we went and we played this thing. And man, the, the people at Disney, their talent booking people like flipped out. They just couldn't believe how good it was. And later they just said, yeah, you know, it's just the way you connected with everybody. And I could feel, I'm going like, yeah, nobody was like looking at a music stand and playing. I mean, we were just, we were playing the music, which was good music and really fun. Uh, but, you know, we had that instant connection, mm -hmm. both amongst ourselves and to the audience. So uh, that was kind of an interesting learning experience. But, uh, and we, we had kind of a good long ride uh, on that. The, I mean, it tragically, both um, Grayson at 39 years old ended up coming down with a vile, pernicious type of cancer that took him out in like six months. It was, and you know, he had two young children. It was just a, a devastating catastrophe, you know, so sad. And we kept the band going. And, and five years after that, my friend uh, Keith Wilson had a totally unexpected uh, heart attack that just killed him. And, you know, and, you know, I, I, for a couple of years, I continued doing that music with other people, but, you know, it just really was never the same. So I kind of stopped doing that and, uh, um, and that was sort of the heart of my uh, electronic music side of things. And, you know, um, I really uh, just started really getting back into the trumpet quite a bit more. Um, and there's some other people that I play electronic music with, you know, and, uh, uh, and I've done a couple of other projects and I've got a couple of others looming right now. So time is, you know, I'm interested in restarting, but I'm starting back with, you know, my analog roots um, as far as that stuff goes. And, uh, um, but it's interesting, you know, you just never know how things are going to go in your life. Uh, and, uh, you know, that stuff is, uh, you know, tragic, you know, what, uh, you know, they say that people come into your lives for a reason, a season or a lifetime, but you never know which that's going to be. And, uh, both of those guys really, I felt like, wow, these guys are going to be, you know, friends for life. Unfortunately, it was a lot shorter than any of us expected, you know, but, well, uh, for sharing this, this is well, yeah, I'm sorry to get, you know, so happy with that kind of stuff, but it's life, you know, real life. And uh, I, I mean, I have, you know, and looking back on that, though, you know, it set the bar. I've, I've been very fortunate in my life uh, a couple of different times to be in really, you know, special musical collaborations. You know, I mean, I've been super lucky. To, I've never done anything other than work in music and play music and do things, you know, uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, along the way, I've, you know, worked with some great people and done some, you know, really interesting and different things. But you just, you, if you have these times where you're, you know that the music that you're playing uh, and with the people that you're doing it with, it's just, it's above and beyond. And it's just so special that um, you can't uh, um, overstate 
uh, how special that is. And it's because it's just not guaranteed, you know, and I, I crave it right now. You know, I'm looking forward to the next collaboration that, you know, where we can all fit together, you know, in such a great positive and creative way where the output far exceeds the input of any single individual, you know, where it really morphs into something really great. And, you know, and honestly, I really, you know, I, I, uh, the last thing that I heard that you did, didn't you just do a live streaming thing yeah, in the last week? It was, it was uh, a couple of days ago for a new EP kind of thing. Yeah. And I, and I really enjoyed listening to that and the spirit behind it. And it made me, you know, really once again, think like, yeah, you know, it's been a long time since I've been in something that is uh, this collaborative and open and creative. And I loved it. I, I, I like all the players that were in it and what you guys are doing. So uh, kudos to you and good, good luck to it. And um, I, yeah, but uh, um, and you know, I think there's some other things that are worth mentioning because this is like really off <laughs> the likelihood of even like talking about somebody like Michael Brecker. Um, we did a bunch of those Akai clinic kind of things together mm -hmm. and uh there was an odd one that we did in new york city and um akai had this idea of you know getting you know michael and i together um it, it was for something for sam ash i think but uh, nonetheless they they told us they said hey listen there's this keyboard player that we met recently we did something in boston and he um, he's a young kid, but he's a really good guy. And we just want to fly him down to play with you and Michael. And you're like, well, oh, okay, how cool, you know? Uh, so this guy came down and, and we were trying to figure out some things that we could do together. We're playing and, you know, just doing some demo stuff, but, you know, we are trying to find some opportunities to actually groove out on some stuff. And, uh, we were playing like footprints, I think. And, just in that tune, in the last section, there's that one place where the chords just change by a half step or something, you know? And every time we got to that place, the keyboard player, he just kind of stumbled a little bit. Like he just wasn't sure. He said, I know this is a different chord, but I just don't know what it is. And, you know, at any rate, you know, I mean, we did this thing and, you know, I just thought it was kind of curious, you know, and I said, oh, okay, every time, you know? Sure, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, several years later, this guy from Akai, who was a friend of mine, called me up and said, hey, by the way, um, I talked to that keyboard player from Boston, Dave, the other day. Oh, yeah. He says, says yeah, he's, he's done with school. He moved back to uh, Virginia Beach and he's working in his family business and he's playing and uh, things are going well. Oh, great. Literally, like the next day, Brecker called just to catch up. We're chatting about some things. And out of the blue, he said, do you remember a couple of years ago when we played that little clinic thing and there was that keyboard player from Boston? And I said, yeah, that kid Dave. I said, coincidentally, yesterday, I just heard something about it. He says, oh, what? And um, I told him what I'd learned. And then I made the comment. I said, yeah, I remember there was that one tune that we played. And every time we got to that one place in the changes, he wasn't familiar with it. He just kind of stumbled a little bit. Yeah. And Brecker like stopped my world. I don't remember another word of the conversation because he just, he threw me for such a loop. He goes like, oh yeah, I don't, I don't remember that. He says, you know, but there was this one rhythmic thing that he did that I really, really liked. And I'm going like, geez, man, oh man. All, you know, after all this time, all I could remember was the one simple thing that this guy couldn't do. And here, Michael Brecker, you know, one of the greatest living musicians ever, all he can remember was the one special thing that this guy could do. I said, man, what do I miss every single day? I literally, I was walking around stymied for a couple of days just going, man, you know, what am, am I just prejudging everything in my life like that? You know, and I remember sometime later I was, you know, with Brecker and we were, he was doing something up at in Jacksonville at North Florida College and uh, invited me to come up and join. He and Randy were there. So we were out and we went for a walk on the beach and we were chatting. And I, I kind of brought that up and I told, I said, remember this, that conversation you and I had and you did that? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, you know, 
I wasn't right for a, several days after that, the way in it, he pretended like he didn't remember that part of it. But, you know, it was, but that speaks volumes about him mm. is that, you know, in every situation, you know, he's like looking for the most positive thing in it. He's listening for things that, you know, are really special and things that, you know, he wanted to incorporate into his own playing, you know, and, and likewise, he was very open about, you know, giving, you know, I mean, since obviously a lot of people were always seeking that out from him, you know, but, uh, well, Sam, um, thank you very much. <laughs>